inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I also want to acknowledge my graduate student, Kate Van Doren, who worked with me to put this presentation together. Um, I'm going to try to cover far too much in my eight minutes. I, I couldn't help myself, so I hope you'll bear with me as we race through this. Um, I'm a bit of a statistical outlier here, firstly because I'm from Australia, um, but secondly because I'm not going to talk about juveniles. I'm going to talk about another group of young people uh, young people in the adult criminal justice system and what I'm hoping to do is point out some of the similarities and some of the issues for that group. So very, very briefly I'm going to talk about who are justice involved young people and then look at some data that we've collected in Australia around morbidity, around polymorbidity and around mortality in this group, particularly focusing on re-entry. Um, and then just have a little bit of a think about what some of the implications for re-entry might be and why that might be of interest to you guys from a US perspective. So who are young people? Well, I guess internationally um, the, the most widely accepted definition is people aged 15 to 24 years of age. So um, although both in Australia and the US we consider people at the age of 18 to be adults from the criminal justice perspective, from a health perspective and from a social perspective, we typically think of people up to the age of 24 as being young people. So, so I guess my question is are we forgetting about this group um, when, when they do end up in the adult system as young people? So just to, to give you some context, here's the, the age distribution of prisoners in Australia from our most recent national census last year. So you can see that we've got a, a wide age range and in Australia we've got an ageing prisoner population. But um, it's still the case that almost one in five prisoners in Australia is a young person in the adult system, 19.3%. So roughly one in five prisoners in Australia are young person. Now, although both the, the size of the prison population and the incarceration rate in the US are higher, the age distribution is actually remarkably similar. So again, when you look at this, about 19.4%, roughly one in five again, of people in the adult prison system in the US is a young person. So I hope that that's at least some evidence that we might be talking about similar experiences in Australia and the US with respect to young people. Now we're talking today primarily about re-entry and that's important because the age profile of people being released from prison is different from the age profile of people in prison. Um, now that might not immediately sound like it makes sense but it does actually make sense because not everybody's released with the same speed and people who cycle in and out of the system more quickly are more likely to be released on any given day. So what we have here to illustrate that point is the age distribution of, of um, prisoners in a, in a cohort that Catherine mentioned before, a randomised control trial we're undertaking. So this is a survey of 1,328 people being released from an adult, adult prisons in Queensland in Australia. Um, each of these people is just about to be released from prison and you can see the age distribution is a little bit different. It's skewed more towards young people because young people are cycling through more quickly um, and indeed around about one in four people being released from prison in this cohort is a young person. Now it's ju not just this cohort, we have another study which I'll talk about briefly in, in my remaining six minutes, um, looking at mortality in young people. This is a, the age distribution of everybody released in the state of Queensland in Australia over a 14 year period, so more than 42,000 people being released from prison and it's more or less exactly the same, one in four people being released from prison is a young person. So that's how it looks like when you put all of those distributions together. It's very messy, but the point's very simple. One in five people in adult prisons is a young person. One in four people being released from an adult prison is a young person. So um, I'll leave it to you to decide whether that's a, a forgotten group, but it's certainly a significant group. Um, and why is it significant? Well, we know that, uh, that among adult prisons, we know that the prevalence of substance misuse is very high in prison populations generally, but it's even higher among young people in prison. So what you see here is a, a variety of indicators of risky substance use um, in our cohort, or the passports cohort, the RCT. Red bars indicate young people, blue bars indicate older people in prison. So you can see there that the prevalence of each of these indicators of substance use is very high, but it's also significantly higher for younger people than for older people. So the vast majority smoking tobacco, the majority with very risky patterns of alcohol use before coming into prison, nearly everybody with a history of illicit drug use. You'll see there that the only indicator where young people are not significantly higher is a history of injecting in prison. Even though we had 13.7% of our cohort of young people injecting in prison um, in the last year, overall the proportion of older people, the, the proportion of older prisoners who'd been injecting in prison at some point was higher. You can see there that almost one in four of our older prisoners had injected in prison at some point in the past. Well, why does that matter? In, in the Australian context we don't have as much of a problem with HIV but we do have a very significant problem with hepatitis C and indeed you can see that consistent with that the prevalence of hepatitis C is around about 50% higher in older prisoners 
than in younger prisoners, even though it's roughly one in five among young people. So what we have here is an opportunity, in my view, for prevention. We're seeing very high prevalence of risky behaviour in young people, but it's not yet manifesting in, in contracting infectious disease. We have an opportunity with these young people to prevent uh, um, the, the decay of health. This is reflected as well when we ask about chronic conditions. These are also data from the passport study um, looking at a diagnosis of chronic illness of various sorts in the last 12 months. So you can see that on, there's a variety of, of illnesses here and I won't go into the details, but on every one of those, almost without exception, um, the exception being intellectual disability, um, older people have a higher prevalence of chronic disease than younger people. And again, a lot of these chronic diseases are behaviourally driven, which again indicates opportunities for prevention, for, for improving the health and maintaining the health of these young people in adult prisons. Um, the only thing where we don't really see a difference by age is in mental illness, where, where it's already been mentioned before, there's a very, very high prevalence of mental illness among both younger and older people in the adult criminal justice system, at least in Australia, and I'm sure things are not that different over here. We have a roughly two in five of our cohort, younger and older people, having been diagnosed with a mental illness at some point in the past, and a very high prevalence of, of suicide, and self, suicide attempts and self-harm in this group and also very, very high levels of psychological distress. You can see there on the, the bars on the right, measured using the K10, which is a very robust screener for psychological distress. Roughly one in four of our young people, many of whom have a history of, of suicide attempts and self-harm, was extremely distressed in the weeks prior to their release from prison. That's important from my point of view because if we're interested in preventing harm post-release, this is the time to do it while we still have an opportunity to um, engage with these young people. So in a nutshell, young people in prison, a higher prevalence of health risk behaviour, but so far a lower prevalence of adverse health outcomes. That's, that screams opportunity to me. So let's look at, at how this overlap together. So you'll recall from the previous slides that roughly one in two of the young people in our study um, has a history of mental illness and or a risk of suicidal behaviour and self-harm, um, roughly 51%. Um, that overlaps a lot with chronic illness and we know this from other studies in Australia and elsewhere as well, that the majority of those with a mental illness also have at least one chronic health condition. Um, again, more than half of our young people in our cohort have at least one chronic health condition. And not surprisingly, that also overlaps very significantly with substance use. And I've just taken one particularly important indicator of substance problems here, a history of injecting drug use. You can see that people with a history of injecting drug use are very likely to have both a history of mental illness and at least one chronic health condition. So when you look at how these overlap together, it's basically like this, that one in four young people being released from custody is suffering from this polymorbidity. So that's at least one chronic health condition, a history of mental illness and self-harm and a history of injecting drug use. So within this very high risk group, there's a subset who are a particularly high risk and there are clearly opportunities for prevention there that can be very cost effective and hopefully very effective as well. Why might this matter? Um, now unfortunately, this, the, the top two bars here are meant to be dashed lines. What this is, is, is a, a survival curve and I'll try to explain this to you in 15 seconds or less. Um, going from left to right, we have time. Um, the vertical axis is the percentage of people still alive. We're following people for a year. If everybody was still alive at the end of that year, we'd have a straight line going across the top of this graph. The steeper the lines, the more people who are dying. Um, and this is among 42,000 people, everybody released in Queensland for a 14-year period. So a very, very large cohort of people. What we see is that the, the lowest bottom solid line there, the blue line, indicates the, the deaths among older people after their release from prison within their first year post-release. The red line indicates mortality among young people in their first year post-release. Now immediately you might think this is a good news story, it indicates that the absolute mortality rates are, are lower among young people than among old people. But it's actually not so good and the reason is that the top two lines here indicate the expected mortality among their age matched peers in the community. So what that means is that the higher blue line is the expected mortality among older people in the community. The higher red line is the expected mortality among younger people in the community. The gap between the expected and the observed is how much the risk of death is increased among people being released from prison. So you can see there that the risk of death is hugely elevated among prisoners in general, but among young ex-prisoners in particular. Um, so another way, and this is my last slide before I sum up, is, is to represent it like this. This is what's called a standardised mortality ratio. In other words, it tells you how much the risk of death is increased among ex-prisoners. So if, the, if that ratio is one, it's the same. If that ratio is two, the risk of death is doubled. What we're seeing here, particularly among young people, is a huge elevation in the risk of death after release from prison. You can see there that um, for young women, it's 39 times higher 
than among young women in the community. Among young men, about 22 times higher than among young men in the community. So, and you can see that although that risk is elevated for all ex-prisoners, it's most elevated for young people. And that's because young people in general in the community have pretty good outcomes. These kids are the exception. So to sum up, and I think I've kept inside my eight minutes miraculously, um, young people are a very large and overrepresented group within the, criminal, the adult criminal justice system. One in five prisoners, but one in four releases. So young people are overrepresented among releases from prison. In addition to their justice issues after release from custody, 80% will have to face at least one health issue or drug-related issue in the community, which obviously is going to tie into the justice-related issues. And one in four young people after release are experiencing polymorbidity, which we looked at before, which is a problem in each domain, at least one chronic health condition, at least one mental health condition, and at least one substance use condition. So a very, very high risk group. And the mortality rate for young ex-prisoners is hugely elevated compared to their peers in the community. In our study, 23 times higher. Similar studies in the US from Ingrid Binswanger in Washington State and from David Rose in North Carolina are showing very similar results. Um, so this is not an Australian phenomenon, unfortunately. So what are the implications for re-entry? This is my last slide. Uh, I guess my argument would be that if we're interested in maximising bang for our buck, young people in the adult prison system are a very good opportunity, to, a very good group to target because we have a very high prevalence of risk behaviour in this group and we have a very high prevalence of acute harm and obviously deaths due to overdose and suicide are, are a most extreme form of acute harm but we have a lower incidence of chronic illness. We have an opportunity to prevent a lot of deaths and to prevent the onset of a lot of chronic illness. So age appropriate evidence based interventions um, have the opportunity to reduce the prevalence of both short term and long term harm in these young people. And of course, rigorous evaluation of reentry programs is, is what we need to go to next. And, and I, I really believe rigorous is the, the key word there. Um, the third point I want to make is just that the, the old adage that prisoner health is public health, that even if we're not interested in the health of these young people once they return to the community, if we're interested in the health of the community, it's worth supporting these young people. You saw that the prevalence of hepatitis C, as one example, is much lower among young people on release from prison. If we can support those people to maintain free of infection, that's not only good for them, it's also good for their families and for their community. And just lastly, I think even if we're not interested in health at all, I think young people are an important group to focus on because what we have here is a rare convergence of criminal justice and public health goals. In other words, that if we can improve health outcomes for young people around mental illness, around chronic disease and around drug use, in addition to improving their health, we have the opportunity to reduce reoffending, and hopefully everybody's happy. Thank you.